This is Colonia Cast, episode 46. Today we're joined by Dr. Jeanette Weineken, who is a professor of biological sciences at Florida Atlantic University. Uh, Dr. Weineken has uh, authored or co authored over 100 peer reviewed publications um, dealing with many topics in sea turtle biology, ecology, and morphology, and physiological ecology in many different areas. She's also <laughs> edited or authored over five different books dealing with turtles, including the biology of sea turtles, uh, the anatomy of sea turtles, which we'll dive into today, as well as the biology of turtles from structures to strategy of life, which is one of my personal favorite books. I think it's sort of a treasure trove of information, uh, anatomical and morphological information you can't really get anywhere else. Uh, so we'll link all of those books in the description for those interested. Uh, Dr. Wanikin is also the director of the FAU Marine Science Center at the Gumbo Limbo Nature Center. Uh, and so we're really excited to talk to her today. She has an incredible amount of experience and knowledge about sea turtles. And uh, so thank you for coming on. It's, it's an honor. Oh, that's, well, thank you very much for having me today. All right, Jason, you want to start us off? Yeah, so we usually start this off with like a pretty uh, like classic question, I guess, you know, like why turtles? But like for you, we're going to kind of tailor it, uh, you know, to uh, your interest and ask, you know, not just why turtles, but like why sea turtles, uh, you know, of all things. Well, uh, <laughs> that's a that's an awesome question. But I'm going to start. I'm going to tell you why turtles be, and then why sea turtles, because they're it's it's kind of a different uh, answer. I mean, uh, as a kid, I was fascinated by uh, dinosaurs, you know, little, little kids, you know, when you're three, four or five, you, you get into dinosaurs. And I, you know, said to my mom, I want a pet dinosaur. And she says, mm -mm, not going to happen. And so uh, how about a turtle? And so that's what started it a long time ago. And uh, I, I'm one of those people that, you know, went to the, at that point the turtles were sold at a at you know like a the the old version of a kmart but uh um you know i would buy the use my little allowance and buy the ones that were kind of damaged you know back legs didn't work or had bad eyes and of course a few those few first few animals were cheap but they also didn't live uh, when we finally uh, decided, well, maybe we should get one that's normal. Um, that one lasted 29 years. And, uh, you know, it, then uh, you know, my grandmother called one day when I think it was at about five and said, there's a turtle in my yard. And so we ran over there with my mother and um, we brought home um, a box turtle from her yard in Illinois. And um, that turtle I had until about I had him for almost 60 years, so just shy of 60 years, and uh, which tells you a little bit about my age, which is fine. Um, and you know, I the, the next year we we discovered that there was uh, a, a zoo probably about 30 miles away from my house that had turtles um, that were always dropped off after kind of summer summer family trips where people would find a turtle on the side of the road and think they're going to keep it for a pet and then find out nah they don't want it so they you know suddenly the zoo would have like 60 box turtles and every year we would stop up there and see the all of the, in essence this herd of turtles and we adopted a few from that zoo and i, I still have one of those alive today so um uh, you know the turtles have been part of my life for a long time uh, I was also fascinated by them and um, kind of would sneak into the adult section of the library to read about their natural history. And the one thing that we didn't have in Illinois was, was those, you know, turtle flipper morphs. So um, when I got a chance to learn about them, I, th I, mean, I thought they were beautiful, but I never thought I'd be studying them. So uh, fast forward, you know, to my college years uh, you know i was got it very interested in how turtles uh move how they locomote because you know some of them get up on their legs like you know, like a you know galapagos tortoise or an albatross tortoise and, you know or even a red foot they you know they look like elephants walking and others 
you know, have their legs splayed out to the side. So I thought, oh, cool, this is really interesting. I can actually study this. Uh, the only problem was when I got to graduate school after spending about a year and a half on that, there was uh, two major uh, publications that came out in that field, which pretty much took me off of uh, that as a PhD project. So, uh, you know, when somebody else who's the leader in, in the morphology field publishes in your area, it, you know, it often, you know, ch changes your trajectory. So uh, after trying out a few other things, uh, the one thing my, my major professor told me was, he says, well, you, you have this many years to finish. You better pick something where you know quite a bit about it. And so that's what I did. I picked, I, the, at that point in time, uh, studying the locomotion of sea turtles was, you know, we knew they moved their flippers up and down, but we really didn't understand the mechanisms of how they worked. We didn't really have a good feeling for the anatomy in a way that related to function. And of course, they're moving through water, so it's not like anything else. You know, it's not the the physical forces are different. So that that was kind of the trajectory, and it was an accident that I ended up with uh, studying sea turtles. Obviously, it was a good accident because it's uh, landed me in my my career. It's really interesting. It, it, a lot of people that we've had on in the past, it's uh, they'll have a lot of publications, but it's not. Yours were very consistently sea turtles. So it's something that's very much, it seems like, followed the trajectory of your career, which is really interesting. Yeah. And so maybe we could start. I think that's an interesting place to start off with talking about um we you, or you've published the book, The Anatomy of Sea Turtles, that was sort mm -hmm. of a compilation of all this information that I imagine at the time was kind of in other in different areas. So you kind of brought this all together. Uh, some of it, um, but yeah, the Anatomy of Sea Turtles was um, a contract from the National Marine Fishery Service, which was is a, a, a U.S. based uh, government agency, and they they were particularly interested in having a good resource that would help everybody who comes across sick and or injured sea turtles uh, or dead sea turtles uh, first of all be able to identify them be able to identify them from parts and um, recognize when they're doing um, gross necropsies what they're looking at and so um, that's why the book is free it's uh, it was paid for by taxpayer dollars it took me about two years and um, you know, I had a pretty heavy uh, hand in having done a lot of these, you know, things where you go down to the beach and you have 300 pounds of something dead on the beach that you've got to take apart uh, efficiently, quickly, and figure out, you know, what's what's normal uh, and what's abnormal, and because that's 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 book is really all about what's normal, and um, so I uh, f focused in on making sure that I covered the major organ systems. Um, didn't do as much with muscles as I'd love to, because uh, in the reality, uh, unless you're interested in uh, locomotion or the uh, putting things back together, uh, the muscles, that that's the one thing I wish I could have done more with. Uh, but um, in terms of the, the goal of the book, it was, it was pretty, pretty uh, uh, comprehensive. And uh, it does have a few errors in it that I'd love to fix, but uh, not many. And uh, yeah, then even, you know, so I have the book handy. <laughs> so, uh, but it's, if you grab this book, at least the original printings of it, it, it you know, the, my, my goal was, well, this is going to be used in the field or this is going to be used when somebody's cutting up something dead and may have bloody hands or whatever, you know, need to hose it down. So, uh, we couldn't do it all on uh, waterproof paper, but we could. Pick, we picked paper that would be pretty tolerant of of getting wet and, and being wiped off and cover. You know, I, I'm. You know, they've picked a spiral binding so you could fold the bo book flat on your. You know, when you're working, and so there's a lot of lot of thought that went into that. Right, I I remember being uh, like in middle school and, and curious about turtle anatomy in general. And I was in, in searching and searching for something that had all of the information in one place. And I came across the, the anatomy of sea turtles and was like, wow, this is incredible. Yeah. But I'm, I'm curious 
in the process of compiling that and getting all the information, like you mentioned, going out and actually looking through dissections, seeing if this is something you can include in there and, and so on. What was the process of compiling all the information for that book like? Because there are so many incredible, I mean, it's over 200 figures and yeah. every sort of detail. What was that like? Uh, so the, you know, the first thing of course is, you know, because I was trained in morphology, I, you know, I could pretty much lay out in my mind, you know, we want to have a big picture first, you know, for those people who would never done this before, you know, what's, what are the foundations for identifying the species? And then, um, what are the, you know, sometimes you don't have a body, you have bones. So can you identify it from bones? So we needed to make sure we had the skulls, which are the, probably the most common thing to get um, retained and for, and the ones that, that can be used most effectively for um, species identification. So the first part was really about, you know, introducing, you know, how do you, how do you tackle this, this topic? And, and then how do you identify the species? And then we went through the organ systems and uh, that's, you know, that was pretty, pretty, pretty standard stuff, really. Um, I mean, the, the details of the sea turtle part wasn't standard, but of course, you know, you, you cover the skin and, and the scoots and the and you, the skeleton and the, the muscles and then, you know, the uh, the gastrointestinal tract and the uh, your genital tract. And, and I mean, you just go through all, all the organ systems. I think I got them all in there. So if I left one out, I don't nobody's complained about it yet so in in the process so all, all of us are are starting out kind of with research i think a lot of us are are writing some of our first papers and such and something right. I've, is, I, I've worked on a project with western pond turtles and red-eared sliders and looking at modeling competition between the two and habitat use and in the process of actually writing the paper and this is a, a much smaller scale compilation than the anatomy sea turtles but i learned a lot about the system and about the organisms through writing the paper so yeah. in writing the anatomy of sea turtles was there anything that's kind of specific detail wise that you hadn't noticed before that you found really interesting about some anatomical aspect <laughs> almost everything um because you know it's one thing to you know, when you're working on your PhD and if you're working on, you know, like I say, I was working on locomotion and the shape of the body and, and um, for locomotion, you, you know, you, you identify the bones and you try to figure out what the muscles are doing with the bone relative to the bones. And this is, this is a while ago. So, you know, a lot of the techniques we use now for understanding motion were, were not a reality. Um, so, you know, the, so some of us, this was, just looking at it from the standpoint of again what's normal as opposed to how does it work and um and then you know i'd never really spent time doing you know one of the things i need to do is describe what the, the head and and do these what we call mid sagittal cuts um so that uh so i mean part of it was how do you do that without mucking things up and um yeah so you know, because we weren't doing histology, we we would we my students and I would um, mostly me would freeze these things and then um, you know find someone who would let me run a a turtle through their saw. Uh, that was that in itself was kind of interesting. Um, you know, so I mean, I used used a fair number of um, standard you know saw and and. Uh, Dremel tool and and uh, occasionally I got got lucky and somebody had a bandsaw that they would, was was made for that kind of stuff. But a lot of a lot of uh, the things I learned were because I had not had the opportunity or the reason to look at the structures in that particular view or that particular way. And uh, you know, so it's uh, you know I would say that you know I never really looked at the brain in in any way that was meant to show it intact or mostly intact um as you, you know if somebody said take the brain out you know i would often just you know say okay you know, slice the top of the head off and then you start at the back and pull it forward and i didn't care if i broke the the nerves or not because i wasn't thinking about it that way and uh now i you know i know how to do it because i had to 
not only show the brain, but the stuff that comes off of it. Um, same with the kidneys. The kidneys are, are behind the, the salomic membrane. Um, it's one thing to see these slightly lumpy, dark structures um, silhouetted behind the salomic membrane, but I had to uh, take that salomic membrane off and trace the kidneys back and where, where, where are the ureters and where, you know, well, how does the circulatory system interact with that? And kidneys are really fascinating. So, um, and in reptiles, that you know, the, at least uh, in turtles, that's one of the things that uh, often gets uh, affected. Whether it's whether it's through, uh, uh, in the case of sea turtles, whether blunt force trauma from being hit by something often affects the kidneys, or uh, you know, if they're in captivity, poor diet uh, can affect certainly affect the kidneys and. So I, I learned a lot about that. Um, just having to describe the uh, uh, cloaca. I mean, that when you when you think about it, that is you know, for a turtle. That's pretty normal to have all those different openings. And when the uh, ureters don't dump into the bladder, you just kind of go, "Well, that's different." Yeah. Uh, so, so I mean, it's a normal reptile thing. But if you hadn't thought about it before, it's a uh, it's a it's a source of um, of learning something new, right? I I want to jump back to the brain because that's something that's really fascinating. There's not a lot of information on this for turtles in general, yeah. but there's a diagram in the anatomy of sea turtles that looks at the differences in shape and mm -hmm. just the overall growth shape, but also the brain regions of different of, of different species of sea turtles, and it, that's really fascinating. Why? Do you think there are those differences, kind of small differences, but overall differences in gross morphology of the brain in sea turtles? Uh, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, I can give you some hypotheses. I mean, first of all, the you know the the brain is basically the most anterior extension of of the uh, dorsal hollow nerve tube, which is part of our vertebrate vertebrate. Uh, characteristics um, and it develops its vesicles or its or its components sequentially uh, you know in response to um, genes that are expressed sequentially as well so the timing uh, I think probably the timing this is a hypothesis this is the, the timing of of when those genes are expressed will say stop this part start another and if, if this one goes on farther or longer then you get a longer section. In terms of um, the other piece of the story is that there's a an ontogenetic ch change. In other words, from hatchling to adult, the the brain is proportionally larger in uh, disproportionately large in, in hatchlings and young young turtles. And they I hate to put it this way, but turtles seem to kind of outgrow their brains. Uh, you know, the things that become more important in terms of um, you know, making sure they can uh, reproduce, making sure that they they can um, metabolize in the environment they live in. You know, and so in sea turtles, they're constantly exposed to seawater. They have to get rid of that salt. They have these huge hypertrophied salt glands, which are taking up part of the head, the head space, um, jaw muscles, neck muscles. Um, all of these things are, you know, critical parts of how the animal makes a living. So there's only some of the, as long as the brain is doing the job it has to do, it's, um, you know, the variation, it, the minor, relatively minor variations in shape are going to be um, available, but not, maybe not, um, I don't, I can't tell you how significant they are. The, 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 the one turtle where there seems to be a really big difference in, in the uh, brain shape is in the leatherback because the leatherback skull instead of just being a roof seems to have this cone uh if this was the 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 top of the skull this cone of cartilage in here and up in that cartilage is the uh, uh pineal body which is involved with sensing the uh, circadian basically pineal bodies that involve the circadian rhythms and that senses uh day length and that seems to be pretty important in migration and also in um, reproduction. So 
because that's a that's a neuroendocrine organ and um so you know the leatherback is you know it's a big turtle big head um and uh you know the bone is fairly thick except in that area so um so that's a that's a pretty uh different brain um structure and more to the point it's a different head structure and uh, so the, what the animal these animals do by having cartilage then it's just overlying um overlaid by a thin sheet of bone it's uh and that thin sheet of bone has a white or pink area um so that there's better uh potential for the light to get through all the other sea turtles even the really big ones don't have this particular uh confirmation and uh, it's probably because the the skull just isn't that thick with the others to to prevent uh, uh light from getting through so the pine wheel is still there i think the only other one that seems to have a particularly um uh thin or close area between the brain and the skull would be the kemp's ridley that also is a species that has a um has a a uh situation where the uh, pideal is really really close to the to the and really sh you know very short attachment to the to the uh, yeah. top of the skull and that's a very thin skull because they, they aren't a big turtle it's that's interesting that, that was something that was pointed out in another paper i believe we're looking at differences in in photosensitivity and the reception of of how turtles are perceiving light it seems like leatherbacks just in general, morphologically and, and ecology wise are exceptions, but yeah. maybe you can talk about the differences in light in, well, it, it maybe take, well, I'll take a step back, but as humans, I think we're really conditioned to think about the brain because it's really, that runs a lot of our show. Whereas other animals, it's maybe not as important. It's more of a, a, it has more of a passive role in in guiding the organism whereas other senses are the things that are really conducive to fitness of that animal in in sea turtles sense wise how are the different senses developed which ones are sharper and i guess that's all sort of relates back to the brain it's a complex question but yeah so okay, okay. so i mean you know one of the things that if you look at um you know a brain uh it's it's got really big olfactory uh bulbs uh you know in terms of the size of the different parts of the brain the cerebrum is large the olfactory bulbs which uh um, are right adjacent to the uh, cerebrum is large the optic lobes are really big and then you know then of course they have a, a reasonable size uh cerebellum and so those those components all the difference is they're kind of linearly arranged, whereas in us, we've had elaborations of our brain so that parts are folded over. And we may have, you know, we start out with the same basically basic structure. Um, but, you know, the sen your point of, about the senses, um, I, I don't know that I'm going to be able to fully answer that question. You know, I mean, the animals have, um, we know a fair amount about their vision and, um, and that's in part because there's been a lot of lot of work that's been done with their with turtle vision in general. Um, we know that the, you know, they they have kind of three photopigment, or we suspect they have three photopigments, and that you know gives them they uh, gives them color vision. They're, and we've had students come through uh, who've done behavioral tests, and colleagues who've come through who've done neurological tests. And to, to show that the, you know that these animals can can see colors some better than others, um, and uh, that that they seem to be able to use them, how they use them is is still, you know, I think un, unstudied. Uh, so that's you know we know a fair amount about vision. The olfactory sense we were beginning to learn a little bit about, but it's hard to these animals don't have a fully separate. Uh, secondary palate. They have a partial secondary palate. Not all turtles have a secondary palate, but sea turtles have a partial one. But it still means that the airway and the foodway are connected. So how much is taste and how much is is um, 
old faction. I don't think we've got a good handle on that at this point. I mean, these animals definitely breathe through their their mouths as much, if not more, than their, their nose. So the nose may be more sensing uh, sensing smells in the water, but I'm not. I can't tell you because I don't. I think that you know the, that that the studies of olfaction and turtles are sort of in their infancy infancy still. Um, hearing, we know that uh, the turtles can hear relatively low frequency sounds. If you look at their what's called the auditory evoked potentials, which are the uh, ways you you measure uh, if an animal's uh, auditory nerves are picking up sound, and uh, you know, their ear is structured a little differently than yours or mine. We have three little bones that are uh, attached to our our uh, tympanum, our hearing, our eardrum, and as the eardrum uh, vibrates, that that chain of bones just kind of articulates and amplifies sounds in ways that we uh, then you know send sent sent to our uh, our inner ear where the nerves are processed but in turtle we have one bone one long thin bone and um and that often has a little kind of cartilaginous cap on it and that's uh, associated with a tympanum which has a lot of fat next to it so it's not like you know, we have if if you've ever been uh, swimming and you come up and if you, you know if you have water in your ears you really can't hear very well or if you have a, you know a, like a hood on or something like that if you're, you're a snorkeler or a diver, you have a come up with a hood on. You know, if, you, if you've got water trapped uh, or, or air trapped with water on both sides, you just can't hear very well. But you can still detect um, deep, um, what's the word, uh, basically vibrations. So uh, a lot of times you'll feel those. Chest. And if you think about what a turtle shell is, you know, it's their ribs uh, that have been modified as this. I, I would describe it as a big drum head, a big vibrating drum head. So the, the, you know how much the turtle is hearing may not be as much a function of the ear as the whole body may be detecting that sound. Just like you know, like I say, if you're out snorkeling or diving, and you know the boats boats are coming by, you can hear them. You can't localize them, but you can hear them, and you also may feel the vibration in your in your in your chest. So. Turtles may do that as well, likely do that as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, the other senses would be uh, vomeronasal organ. There's some evidence that there, the animals have a vomeronasal tissue uh, patches in their nose. Um, I don't think we understand those at all in a turtle. Um, the few papers that have been done on that are more anatomical and not, not so functional. Um, what am I missing? Taste, smell, sight, hearing. Um, we know they can, they have a sense of touch. Um, you know, it's, I think that's the, you know, yeah. that, that's, that's, I think that's, I think I've covered them all. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's interesting too, to think that it, it it's sort of in its infancy in terms of really understanding primarily how turtles sea turtles specifically are sensing their environment and mm -hmm. i guess freshwater turtles tortoises is it, there's probably even less known so it's it's really interesting well i mean what ironically you know with, with freshwater turtles there's been quite a bit of work done on the brain hmm. uh and particularly associated with hibernation and right. uh, you know if you think about these animals that go down to the, the bottom of ponds and lakes and you know you know, basically met metabolically shut down. The the one area of the brain that stays especially active is that um, optic tectum, the optic lobe area. And it makes sense, again, paying attention to when is the ice gone? When is the, the uh, you know, if you're down on the bottom, you know, they, they, they may not be a, a conscious effort to know when the ice is gone or when the, the winter's over, but day length is a big driver. And so the, those animals shut down a lot of their uh, metabolism and they you know, shut down their blood flow, except between heart, brain, heart, brain, heart, brain. And that, that optic lobe especially is, is, gets a lot of attention from the, from the uh, 
in terms of activity and protection from uh, hypoxia. Right, in terms of just being aware of your surroundings while you're in that situation. That's, it's really fascinating that, to think about just how, how the organism perceiving sort of environment, how that shifts. Um, some, something else sort of going into the realm of the, the viscera and other organs um, uh, that, that you have, an, I think, an interesting perspective on is the, the differences between sea turtles uh, with regard to the proportion of the viscera and, and how big an organ is, like the GI tract or the heart or, and, and, and different areas compared to the full body size differs among sea turtles. But beyond just looking at the difference in itself, we've talked to a lot of taxonomists on the, on the podcast previously, and they're sort of interested in looking at, is it different, but not necessarily why is it different? But with respect to sea turtles and, and major organs, what are the most sort of notable differences in proportional sizes of different viscera and why are those? Uh, okay, so if we talk about uh, GI tract, I mean, it's the, the one that some of the animals, are, yeah, I, mean, I would say all of the uh, chelonids are roughly similar. Um, you know, that's yeah, I, I don't know how else to describe that. They're roughly similar, and the leatherbacks are different. So back to that theme of the leatherbacks are different. But the leather, you know, the, all of the other species are eating, you know, crabs or mussels or um, sea grasses or things that, you know, basically, uh, you know, I can't tell you exactly what proportion of water they are, but it's a lot less than what a a, a leatherback's eating. A leatherback is eating, you know, not only jellyfish, but salps and, and pyrosomes, which are, you know, 98% water. And so that animal has a, a tremendously long esophagus and a tremendously long um, GI tract in general. So the way a leatherback makes its living versus the way a, a hard shell turtle makes its living is really a lot, has a lot to do with packing in enough calories. And so if you're eating, uh, you know, um, you know, a, a whelk and uh, two blue crabs, you probably have your nutrient uh, uh, component for, uh, you know, a couple of days. But if you're eating animals that are 98% water, that's a lot of, lot of volume that has to be processed. And so, you know, leatherback's esophagus, basically, if you think about the back of the mouth, that esophagus goes all the way down to by the urinary bladder. It makes a left turn, comes back up to about the armpit, makes a right turn, and then drops down into the top of the stomach. Wow. Whereas everything else, you know, all the other sea turtles, it's, you know, drops down, makes a left turn, and there's the stomach. So... You know, we're, we're, we're talking about something that's probably 20 times as long as the esophagus is probably 20 times as long in the leatherback as it is in a hard shell turtle. Okay, so that's a lot of GI tract. And what's that, what that is all about is packing in a lot of, you know, think about a life of jello. Your whole life you're eating jello uh, or you're eating jello with little zooplankton in it. Mm, yum. And uh, so you've got this. Um, you know this this tube that's basically packing them down, and then the, then they have these crazy papillae, these uh, you know cone shaped little uh, projections all along their esophagus, and, and they're point in the leatherback especially. They're all they're pointed. They're the keratin around them. You know that's sort of like our fingernails is very um, very sharp on points, and you can think of that sort of like the uh, you know. Uh, a meat blender it's it's taken that stuff and and as as it's as it's moved down they're pointing down so that uh, jelly animals can't escape and that is also a very muscular tube so it squeezes and the water goes out but the jelly animal stays in their esophagus and then the next one comes down and they're always packing those in and moving them down but they have to eat a lot and uh, and get rid of a lot of salt water. So that that esophagus is behaving, uh, I would say, as much for uh, 
storage as it is for processing that that prey until it gets down into their their uh, duodenum and and ileal area. Uh, so a lot lot of differences in that uh, for the poor portions of that GI tract. Uh, the stomach is um, really distensible in all in all the species, but it's it's really obviously so in the in the leatherback again. And this has to do with eating enough low calorie prey to uh, to survive. And you know, for an animal that gets that big, that's a, that's a lot of jellies. Um, whereas the you know, like, let's take something like a loggerhead turtle. You know, it's it's may spend its day you know nipping away at the shell of a a mollusk to to get at the, that animal um but it's you know it's eating relatively high cut calorie concentrations uh in small packages and so it you know its esophagus also will get rid of salt water also prevent um that escape uh if the animal's still alive but it's um and it's got papillae also pointing down but there's you know much shorter distance and much in proportionally, I would say much shorter papillae. So, so that's you know the rest of the GI tract is nowhere near as interesting as the esophagus is to me. Yeah, it's it's really and and the heart too of leatherbacks. It, it, that's sort of the theme here, I guess, is that the leatherbacks are are very distinct, and it, it's such an enigma of a turtle in, in the sense of such a large animal relies on such a low calorie animal resource I, that's in high abundance, but it's just why yeah. that happened is so fascinating to think about what led to that specialization but open yeah niche. Some yeah place there was an open niche and right. uh, yeah and something yeah but in respect to the heart that that's kind of an interesting area uh, we haven't talked about as much just overall in the podcast but turtles have a lot of interesting mm, sort of adaptations in the heart and leatherbacks have a larger kind of more condensed heart i believe but maybe you could talk about the differences there and some of the unique adaptations of the turtle heart. Well, okay, so the, let's let's talk about turtle hearts in general first, which is, uh, you know, we think of our heart as having um, you have two sides. You know, we have our pulmonary side, uh, where which is our right side, where we have blood that flows into our atrium and that moves to the ventricle, and from the the right side of the heart that's pumped directly to the lungs and then it comes back to the left side and the left side, it goes to the atrium and then to the ventricle and out to the body. Um, and we have one aorta uh, developmentally. We start to form two like most proper vertebrates do, but we're, we're, we're we and birds do, do things a little differently. Um, so that's, that's a, I think starting by understanding how mammals work might help us understand how turtles work. Right. So turtles um, do not have that fully divided heart. They have a separate, you know, a clear and separate right atrium. They have a clear and separate left atrium, and the ventricle is um, partitioned but not fully. So it's got uh, what are called cava or, or compartments, and uh, you know, so what, and they also have a really big kind of um, very thin walled chamber that um, collects the blood that goes into the right atrium. That's the sinus venosus. So blood from the head and blood from the body goes into this big thin walled sac. It, you know, a lot of times you don't even see it in a picture because it's on the dorsal side of the heart. And it drains into the atrium, and that's that's one of the initial pacemaker components, and so it's important, you know, for us to get the sinoatrial node. But for turtles, it's a big old bag of blood right. that um, goes into the right atrium, and then you know the you know we we often talk about this as this happens, and then it goes around, and then that happens. But it, you, know, you got to think about it. Both sides are doing the same thing; they're both receiving blood. And both sides are dumping blood into this ventricle that has these three compartments. Well, I could give you excruciating detail on those three compartments, but the part that's probably most important to realize is these the the heart and the lungs work together. 
And uh, so the uh, what happens in a turtle, which is uh, basically the same thing that happens in an iguana or a snake, is they'll take some breaths and then they hold their breath and they hold their breath for a while. And um, so that means that the, the blood is circulating and it can go to the lungs and pick up new, new O2 and get rid of CO2, but that lung is not exhaling at this point. It's right. just a bag of, of air, right? And so the, our understanding of how turtle hearts work is that eventually those that pulmonary trunk is squeezing down so that any blood trying to go through it, it's not going through, it's bumping, you know, it's got resistance. So then it gets rerouted back into the body. So um, those compartments are part of what is critical for rerouting that blood. Um, and then the animal comes up to the surface to breathe, or even if, if it's a tortoise, even decides to breathe, I guess is the better, because you don't have to be submerged to do this. Uh, you know, when, you, when it starts to ventilate itself again, uh, then, the, then both sides of the heart are getting, you know, are gonna be participating in, uh, in, when I say both sides, all three compartments will be participating, but the ones that, you know, then when you get blood going to the system, they have two, two aortas, so both aortas are getting blood from the system and it's going to the lung and then back in. So, um, so it's a, that, that um, big ventricle is playing uh, kind of the role of shuffling blood into different parts to, make, uh, to get it, to get it out to the system or get it to the system in the lungs. Um, it's a, that, that, um, not too confusing because uh, you know without a drawing I'm I'm describing what's happening. Uh, but then in terms of the size of the heart, um, you know they, these animals do have coronary arteries and veins, so the heart muscle gets um, gets its oxygen and and gets rid of CO2 too. Uh, and the heart is also in a in a pericardium, so in, inside a sac that has uh, some fluid in it, and that fluid appears to be um, kind of a, a bicarbonate, uh, has a bicarbonate role. So is when things are fatiguing, you get a buildup of lactic acid. And if it's bathed in bicarbonate solution, that helps to keep the um, buildup of lactic acid from having a, an effect. So that, that part's a hypothesis, but it's, um, I think the, the, like stuff I've read on it is pretty well supported that the heart is a mu muscle is somewhat protected by the fluid in the pericardial sac. And then the, uh, just the, the, the sponginess and the thickness of the, of the uh, ventricle is, you know, I don't think we understand that very well. They have, uh, uh, you know, the, if you were to look at a, the kind of the classic heart you'll, you look at in, in your general biology or your, um, comparative anatomy class would, you know, you'd be looking at a heart with the chordae tendinae and, the, you know, papillary muscles, which are little triangular muscles that are attached to these, these components that help compress that heart when it, when the, it gets the uh, uh, electrical signal to, um, to contract, um, you know, in leatherbacks, it's, it looks like the whole ventricle is just all this, uh, spongy like uh, dense muscle so you, it, it's it almost um i have to say we don't understand i don't think we understand how leatherback uh ventricles work that well uh, there's been several people who've studied them over the years the last you know some of those papers are probably 80 or 90 years old now and i don't think i've got a better understanding from that now than i did when i you know read the, those older papers it's how does blood percolate through this spongy tissue um and do it so efficiently. And I don't think I've got a good answer for you. It's interesting. We, we had uh, Dean on in one of the past episodes and he, he spoke about the unique aspects of the, the vascularization of the limbs. So talking about the heart, the spongy sort of inside of it is yeah. really, they're just unique in all aspects. 
um yeah that's it's it's really fast with with the so you sort of described early on the the cutoff from the pulmonary circulation the it's i believe a left to right shunt and the f both they they have they have to have both you know okay so left to right shunts uh that's gonna be when the uh you know basically when the when we're in a normal ventilation system and when the animals are in apnea it's a right to left shunt, which basically means that the blood is being mo more diverted away from the lungs. Um, it, it, blood is, if you don't think of, necessarily think about it this way, but blood is, is thick and, and relatively thick and viscous. And it's, that's expensive and energetically expensive to pump. So pumping, pumping blood to the lungs, even though they're relatively close and bringing it back is, um, is a waste of, of critical energy when you're not, you know, lifting your head up and breathing right away. So right. the blood tends to be shunted away from the right side, the pulmonary-ish side, and towards the, the systemic side. So that's more the left side of the, of the heart. You know, like I say, it's not fully divided, and I'm not going through all of the, th the three compartments at this point, but you can more or less say, okay, that, that, shunt front of the blood away from the right uh, right side to the left side that's right to left that's what happens when they're holding their breath right i for those interested in very specifics too the anatomy of sea turtles has great diagrams on this so you can really dive into it um but there's a lot to cover now uh so that's yeah, interesting it's sort of an adaptation for diving um maybe we could talk about some of the muscles a bit too and and specifically uh, you talked early on about your work with sea turtle locomotion. And I, I, I think this is an area where it's taken for granted a lot. It's really fascinating to look at how animals differ, sea turtles, turtles differ in terms of their sort of locomotory adaptations and how they move. And it's okay. something that you've worked on. So maybe you could dive into some of the specifics and how sea turtle locomotion differs Oh, wow. Well, so I'm going to be a little hesitant here because you know, I worked on that for, for my PhD, but there were a lot of things I couldn't do because honestly, there, the questions were there, but the technology was not. We now have technology there. So I actually have a PhD student working on sea turtle locomotion using micro CT and, and three-dimensional force measurements. And, um, you know, so yeah, I can, I can, you know, swing back into that a little bit, but I, I'm going to tell you that you know, in about a year or two, we're going to have a much better understanding of sea turtle locomotion than we did in the past. And the, you know, the basic uh, difference here is that, um, you know, with, you know, freshwater turtles or tortoises, you know, their, their limb movements are more, um, you know, reach up, sweep back or reach up, pull back, and so it's, you know, it's a more of a traditional uh, walk or crawl. Um, and, uh, you know, even swimming, they're reaching up and then, you know, as they push back, they're, you know, they're using that, that limb like either a, an oar or a paddle. And um, depending on whether it's under the body or beside the body. So that, but then when they bring it forward, then it's not really grasping, you know, playing a bit as much of a, at least in the water, it's not playing as much of a role in um, uh, generating thrust. It's they, they pretty much need to reset the limb in a for you know it's in its forward position in order to generate um, force. Um, in terms of it, where sea turtles don't do that, so um, where they well, let me rephrase that they often don't do that. They are capable of doing that kind of thing, but they've got this big big hand, you know, the, the flipper is basically all of this forearm plus the hand, you know, flattened out. And so right. you know, if you've ever tried walking around with the, you know, scuba flippers on, it's kind of awkward. Um, but the, so they, they can walk. They, they actually on the, when I watch, when I dive and I, where there are sea turtles swimming, and you want watch them on a lot of times they're doing what's called bottom walking. So they're using left, right movements of the flippers, you know, but then they're not supporting it much. They're not supporting weight with it. So that makes, it makes a difference. Whereas the animals that are crawling around on land, they, you know, they're pretty limited 
Um, and if you watch watch a, even a, a nesting turtle crawling, they, you know the hind limbs work fairly much like a uh, uh, red eared slider or a snapping turtle might work. You know they they kind of lift themselves up as best they can and and left right walk. Um, uh, at least most of them do. Some of them crutch along, you know. But uh, the hind limbs are kind of the pushing and and uh, uh, support supporting and pushing in, in a sea turtle, whereas in a freshwater turtle, there that those that locomotor force is pretty important from the hind limbs as well. Um, but uh, you know, the forelimbs, you know, they have to pull. They have to anchor the sides of their the flippers in and pull. Because that's you know otherwise it's like pushing off with a um, a flat plate and that that doesn't work real well unless you're trying to throw sand. So, um, but you know in terms of the skeleton, uh, you know it's the the flipper is elongated digits. You know so the phalanges are elongated, the metacarpals are elongated. Um, they're I wouldn't say they're webbed, but they're the tissue in between the, the digits is, is uh, there's some muscle there, but um, they, uh, they have a lot of fibrous connective tissue, which except in hatch, the hatchlings can do this kind of movement, but the adults pretty much can't. Uh, possible exception of the flatback, um, flatback turtle in Australia that they have um, a more flexible uh, forelimb than, than I think any of the other turtles I've seen. And I, it may be related to the the nature of their integument, um, but uh, you know, the, if you were to look at a juvenile sea turtle uh, humerus, and uh, it would look a little different just simply because of the way you know when an animal's not trying to pull its limbs under the body, the head of the humerus is is offset in a different way, and so you know, there's some differences there. The hind limbs are not quite as, as different. Like I say, the, those hind limbs and roughly work like they do in a in a red eared slider or, or a tortoise or a box turtle. So, you know, they'll do some. Uh, I think the only ones that I again that seem to be different are the are the uh, leatherbacks, and uh, they they don't as hatchlings they don't seem to do left right left right um, as adults they don't do it. Um, unless they're trying to turn and then really not doing left, right. They're just using one flipper more vigorously than the other. Um, and, uh, and on top of that, they have a, leatherbacks have a ton of cartilage, even as adults. I, I, I often describe leatherbacks as a neotenic turtle. And the reason why I say that is because of all of the cartilage in their, in their skeleton. Yeah, it's, yeah, fascinating how many exceptions the the Derma Kelly sort of follow. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, it's just a really interesting scenario. Uh, it, it, it's interesting to think about those differences in in how the, sort of the lo the apparatus used for locomotion. Um, and you mentioned early on there uh, how sea turtles it will change when they come up to nest. Uh, and so the, the process for sea turtle nesting is fascinating. I I just spent a week at Oshinal and. Costa Rica on the Pacific coast and unfortunately didn't see any nesting turtles. It was, it, this whole year has been weird, but thinking about that whole process of laying the eggs and then where do those hatchlings when they hatch go. And this is another area of work that you've worked in kind of transitioning from the anatomical aspect to more of the ecological and conservation aspect. Um, maybe what are turtles doing? You've got a unique perspective on this when they leave that nest in those first few years or right after leaving? Yeah, well, the first few years, we, it's still pretty much a hypothesis, but it's a it's a hypothesis that's reasonably well supported now. And you know, so I, I got, you know, very interested in swimming and, and locomotion as a graduate student. But the, you know, we really, to me, it was only as interesting as what are they doing with it? You know, why do they have this, what we call a dog paddle? Why do they have, uh, why are they sometimes flapping symmetrically? So you get this kind of movement where the flippers are going up and then I can't, my shoulders don't do that because I don't have turtle humor eye, but they come back down and then they rotate and, and come back up. 
and you know why why are they doing that and so that <clears throat> that was when i started to work with um, a behavioral biologist mike salmon and uh, he and i and uh, another colleague who was very uh much interested in magnetic orientation how the animals know where they are when they're out of sight of land um we started working pretty um intensely on what are the turtles doing when they leave the beach where are they you know what are they paying attention to how do they know not to turn around uh and come back um and that all of that really was you know where i spent you know a, probably the next decade of my life working on, you know, what are the turtles doing with their locomotor systems? And um, that, uh, you know, that really told us that, that you know, that, that vision is only, finding the ocean is a, is a big deal. And uh, um, so if you think about it, you know, these animals are down under the sand. And that, when I say under the sand, we're talking about this much at least. And if it's a leatherback, it's like, my whole arm and then part of my body down there. So it's, you know, pretty, you know, leatherback nests can be down over a meter. And uh, whereas loggerhead nests, you know, or, or that if too bad you didn't see the, the olive ridleys and all those nests are only down, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know, maximally a third of a, a, a meter. And um, loggerheads down down about a third of the meter so anyway but these animals they're you know they're hatching in this group they've never seen daylight they're in night sky and they come out and they sit briefly at, uh, at the surface and uh, the sand falls away from their eyes and then they're they're paying attention to uh these what are the cues that are out there and and a lot of the work we did uh, I'm trying to figure out what the turtles are paying attention to. We not only looked in the field, but we you know, had the turtles tell us what they're they were paying attention to. But we also looked in the lab, which allows us to isolate different uh, cues that the animals can use to get offshore. And then, then once they get offshore, what are they paying attention to? So, uh, long story short, was one when we found out that the animals are not just paying attention; they aren't paying attention to where the moon is. They, you know, in spite of what every newspaper on earth has published, it seems they're not paying attention to where the moon is. And if you think about it, that makes sense because sometimes they're on a coast in which if they waited for the moon, they would never come out of the nest. Or if they would waited for the moon rise, they'd be going back towards land. It doesn't make sense. But they do go when they hatch and they, you know, they're vi very visual at that point. They, uh, uh, at, at the surface, they're very visual. The sand falls away from their eyes. And they do this, I'd almost describe it as a, like in, in computer programming, ones and zeros. And one says, go away. You know, if, if, if you have a one and a zero, you go away from the tall, dark stuff and towards the lower, more open and, and sometimes brighter area. And it's not just, it's not just slope. As a matter of fact, most of the time it isn't slope, but they're, they're paying attention to it. There are slopes, but you can, you can give them a slope and they they preferentially pay attention to those visual cues that say go away from the tall dark stuff and down towards the more open uh horizons and that makes sense because you know land's higher than water so um you know that will get them even on an island will get them to uh get them to the water so uh but once they're in the water and they swim for a while they're they know for, you know their head is only like this much out of the water when they stick their head out. So how do they know where they're where they're going? And getting getting offshore is really all about getting into to waters where the predators are not as concentrated. So if any of you are fishermen, you know that you know when you go fishing near the co coast, you want you're paying attention to where the structure is, and that's where the fish are. And a lot of those fish are predators. Uh, it's also where the crabs are. It's also where the squid are. They, they all those things that use structure. And um, you know, so these turtles are all. It's all about you know. These are small, tasty little morsels. They're high in protein, high in fat at that point. And uh, so they're good prey for many things. So they've got to get offshore. They've got to get out of that area of concentrated predators. And 
when their head is only this far out of the water, how do they know where they're going? Right. And and that's the part where we were we started paying attention to well, what cues are available. So we looked at you know sun position. We looked at um, the uh, at wind. We looked at waves. And you know, long story short, it turns out they're paying attention to the waves. And so by swimming into or quartering the waves as they swim out, it it you know, the, the waves the waves are coming towards shore. So if you swim into them, and get into the shore. And then, um, you know, so that's work that uh, Mike Salmon and I did. And then Ken Loman, who's up at uh, uh, University of North Carolina, he uh, was the magnetic orientation expert. And he says, well, wait a minute, what happens when the waves are no longer reliable? Because without getting into the physics of waves, eventually the wave direction is dri driven more by wind and less by um, proximity to the, to the right. bottom. Yes. And uh, then he was able to test uh, in the lab, and then you know ask the turtles what was going on once they're in the field, and and show that they they actually in that swim offshore, they're 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 calibrating their magnetic compass sense, and uh, then you can use that when the waves are either not present or not available, and and that gets gets them uh, you know not only offshore but probably gives them some good information about where, what regions they're going to be returning to 25 or 30 years later. And that's, that's a big deal. So that was, that was really fun work to do. Uh, pretty tedious work to do, but very, very interesting. And um, what the turtles are doing, like I say, is, you know, that, that offshore swim is all about getting out and away from, from the high concentrations of predators. Now, some of these turtles are, you know, the the ones we've studied so far, the loggerheads and the uh, green turtles are are associating with flotsam when they get out there. And flotsam is that's the natural floating debris. And for, unfortunately, they're also now associating with some of the jetsam, which is the not natural floating debris. But um, that that. Those areas have things growing on them and uh, living in them that are food, and they provide visual protection uh, for the, for those hatchlings. And so it's a good place to grow. It's a place to to uh, uh, hang out. It, the, it moves with the currents and moves with the wind. And uh, the, you know the downside is you can get out of it. Um, you know things like. Uh, Billfish and and uh, mahi, uh, the dolphin fish can, are also no fun. Think those being good places to eat, but the turtles seem to get in there. And um, and we we're yeah, you know, this was observed back in oh gosh, there's some reports from old cruises, you know, cruises back when the aristocracy would, you know, fund natural history cruises and. Uh, naturalists would come back with boats full of specimens and where they found them and describe where they are. And so we, we had a pretty good idea of the old, um, those old uh, things that, you know, the, the old literature, really old literature about where those turtles were. And uh, that those were, you know, there was a, you know, they're hanging out where there's food and protection. And, uh, and, and then, Separately, um, uh, I got an, a chance about a decade ago to start working with miniaturized satellite transmitters and actually turtles. Um, we can't follow the hatchlings yet because the transmitters have um, are either are too heavy or they have other issues that may compromise the behavior of the animal. But as they get bigger, you know, so if you have a turtle that's about the size of my hand, we can put a little transmitter on it follow it for you know, months and uh, we had to test all of that stuff in the lab first to make sure that we were you know we knew you know that, that the tags were not changing their behavior we had to make sure they were not uh, you know when at that point in time and actually even still it's sort of like throwing a, a rather nice laptop in the water every time you put a satellite tag on a turtle so um, in terms of price not in terms of size but in terms of price so you you want to make sure you're getting real data not not some artifact of 
the way the animals are being modified by these tags. So the, that was a big deal to make sure we could measure that properly. But one of the cool things about these little tags was they had temperature sensors on them. And they told us uh, not only where the turtles were within a big area, but, you know, it also told us the temperatures. And so, you know, using remote sensing of, um, of the, uh, uh, ocean surface and you know knowing where the turtles were we could you know could, could actually hypothesize that those animals because they were warmer than the sea surface temperatures were they had to be basking and they also had and but if you had temperatures that were still warm at night we knew that was the trapping of temperature um uh, in, in the sargassum and we did a pretty basic test of that uh it in some pools and buckets and then just recently a, a student from the university of florida uh really did a much more rigorous test of that and uh, so the so that habitat that sargassum or flotsam is providing food protection and it's a thermal uh refuge as well so that they can actually uh you know make a living there and continue to grow and you know that some of that uh, tagging data was we didn't expect to be getting that information, but uh, we're making those conclusions. But it was really cool to, to put pieces together. I think it, it was interesting too. I think from that paper, or the, I think it was 2014, but uh, they'd also because one of Archie, I think it was Archie Carr who kind of formulated the hypothesis that before they had these small tags, that the the young turtles would follow pretty tightly the Gulf Stream or another gyre or current. But mm -hmm. that paper seemed to show that there's more actually seeking out those sargassum mats for that thermal benefit, the thermal niche yeah. hypothesis sort yeah. of. Yeah. But, so what does that exactly mean? They were kind of they weren't a hundred percent coupled with those currents. They were actively swimming or what was well, that's you know that's another project that uh, my student is working in the locomotion is is trying to tackle, but yeah, you know, and I will tell you that there's a disagreement in among the the folks who do uh, satellite tagging whether they are or not um, being driven by the currents, but it's and part of that is just simply the resolution of where the tag tells you the turtles are. Uh, there's without getting into all of the engineering of the, the tags, you've got uh, this, it's, um, you know, the tag is, is giving you the nearest several kilometers. Um, so some of these sargassum areas aren't that big. So we, we can be pretty confident that that's where they are. And uh, since they're, they're small and they're uh, poikilotherms, heterothermic uh, animals, we know that they're not generating their own heat at that that size so we know that that the animals are are getting into flotsam and and using using that because the flotsam keeps the water from uh, flowing through very you know as vigorously as clear water with nothing in it uh, we know what that those temperatures are like um so uh they you know in in terms of the thermal niche i mean that's all about um making sure that we you know that may, if you're a small animal and you're in the right thermal niche it, it means you can feed you can locomote you can metabolize uh you can grow and growing is a big deal these little turtles have to outgrow their predators and uh uh that's you know they're not going to outgrow big sharks and they're not going to outgrow you know the the few big mouthed animals out there that are predators, but they are, you know, mostly, you know, the name of the game for these little turtles is get away from your predators and outgrow them. And uh, so being in a good thermal environment is, is part of that being where there it's a good thermal environment where their food is even better. And that, you know, so the evidence that the animals are not necessarily just riding the current, has to do with seeing these animals get on the edge of these some of these currents and then there will be eddies and the eddies often will be you know trapping um you know nutrients which means you know we're using um chlorophyll signals in the satellite transmit uh satellite imagery imagery um 
you know, that that's, you know, satellite imagery is used for a lot of things these days. And, you know, the chlorophyll tells us about the productivity of the ocean. And so, you know, if you're, if, if you're in an eddy that's got greater productivity than staying in the current and the turtles are going out there, you know, it's probable that they're doing, you know, they stay there for a little while and then they get back in that current and they, they may get out again uh, at another time. And that's the, it's, it would, it seems like there are an awful lot of opportunities to get out and they don't take them all. But they, you know, they seem to take the ones that are associated with highly productive waters, and uh, especially when they get just a little bit bigger. I mean, if I'm looking at, at a turtle that's that's 100, 120, 150 grams, they obviously have a little less control over their future than an animal that's 300 or 500 grams, something like that. So, right, uh, and that. Yeah, more. Ability yeah. to swim, such yeah, a yeah, yeah, and and dive too. I mean, the, the currents on the surface are not necessarily the same as the ones under, you know, down a little farther. So, they, you know, once they once they've got the ability to do that diving uh, too, it's a, uh, you know, it gives them options. I'm also curious with the work that you did with the turtles immediately after hatching. How did you? How did you follow them and know what, that they were swimming for that amount of period? Get, I assume a lot of this well, was that you can't use tags in that situation. No, so a lot, a lot of that, uh, how long were they swimming was done in the lab. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that was, um, you know, we had to give them a normal light cycle and we had to give them water that was an appropriate temperature. So, you, know, you couldn't give them water that was too hot or too, too cool. So in other words, if we had air conditioning in the room, uh, that got shut off for us, or at least got shut down, so that the turtles got normal, normal temperatures. You get on, you know, out in the ocean. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was ironically the the very first time. Uh, it was a lot of a lot of working with engineers to to develop a a system that would detect, you know, swimming versus resting. So we had this little leather lever arm that they were that that was recording. It was attached to some a device, sort of like. We use my watch as an example, and if the turtle swam a particular direction, we could tell that from the the they we had basically had a little harness on them and a and a leash that went to our lever arm, and the turtle would pull that, so it had to have virtually no friction. That was that in itself was a real challenge, um, and uh, you know, and then we had what was called the sleep swim switch on it that would turn the thing on and off and tell us when the turtles were swimming and not. Um, and we went through several iterations of that. So it's a lot of working with engineers who would listen to crazy biologists saying, I want to do this. Um, and, you know, it worked out, you know, super well. And we were able to uh, show that, you know, using the same techniques, uh, we were able to identify the differences in the species. And we particularly focused in on the species that were, that we knew, uh, you know, we're leaving from the same beaches. So we started with our loggerheads and then moved to our green turtles and then to the leatherbacks. And uh, and they all live, I'm, I'm actually in Turtle Central down here in Southeast Florida, where we get all three of those species nesting on our beach. So we had access to those hatchlings. And then uh, about, geez, I wanna say 2014, 2015, we had the opportunity to to do that same work with a species that wasn't supposed to go offshore. And that was the working with the flatbacks. They, that's an animal that's supposed to stay over the continental shelf. Right. And um, so it was, uh, that was, that was really interesting because they, they were uh, totally different. They're really strong and uh, totally different animal in terms of its behavior. So we were able to look at that and, and see how those animals behaved. And then we came back, to Australia um, a few years later and, and looked at their uh, diving behavior. And it turns out those, uh, those little turtles can dive vigor you know, really well. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're very cryptic. Say the, the waters where those turtles live are not clear blue waters. And uh, they go down to the bottom uh, pretty quickly and they only come up occasionally. You, you, they're hard to see. So, uh, it was it was a real education. Those turtles teach me things. But one, of them, if you're not going to go that far offshore, you better be cryptic and uh, you better be a strong swimmer and able to take advantage of the habitats available. And that's what those little turtles do. 
Right. So one other thing before maybe we can transition to the conservation aspect, uh, and mm -hmm. you also saw it going back to the theme of, of leatherbacks being different, which is consistent and interesting, <laughs> that leatherbacks seem to swim more at night and just overall more than other hatchling turtles. So not only are they different as adults, but there's a difference right away within that first 72 hours to week yeah. of living. Why is that? What is it about them? Well, I think some of it's probably going to come back to their diet. Um, you know, they, you know, they, if you're, you know, eating a super low calorie diet, you have to always be uh, on the lookout for food. And, you know, those animals can, you know, can dive um, you know, even right out of the nest. I mean, you know, when I was one of, one of the things I've done over, over the, my career is, you know, I always, always try to have some project going on, even if my funding is really low. There's an awful lot you can do with your with with your eyes and a, and a you know pair of fins and a snorkel, um, <laughs> and uh, I, I still remember taking leatherbacks out and 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 you know following them offshore and you know I had we had a a boat with a, a depth finder on it and so the boat would f follow far enough offshore that the you know the, actually the turtles pretty much ignored ignored boats but uh, we wanted to make sure we were doing that and i would flag the the person driving the boat and say what's the depth here and because it's, i could see the turtle i'm luckily in, a, in an area where the water's pretty clear and i could see the turtle swimming down and swimming on the bottom and then kicking up sand with its flippers as it, as, as it was swimming and it's like you're a hatchling how deep are you and it was like 45 feet and I'm going, but you know, you you never see a loggerhead or a green turtle hatchling able to get that deep. Wow. So they're already, you know, diving as as hatchlings. They're already uh, getting into areas. I mean, as hatchlings, they're not going to eat right away, but they're already capable of getting into areas where they can take advantage of uh, vertically migrating plankton and um, yeah. So they're. I think that that's constant swimming is. It's not real fast. Thank goodness it wasn't real fast because I was swimming after them, and I'm not that great a swimmer. But uh, it does put you put you in good shape for following the other species. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, it's it's one of those surprises. And then again, my colleague Mike Salmon did did some work with their with the leatherback diving um, as they got older and. Uh, Again, not they're still really young turtles, but as they got older, they could they could dive deeper depths, and that they you know, again they're constantly swimming, and so it makes perfect sense. If you're on a low calorie diet, you better, but uh, and you need to and you need to grow, and you need to uh, migrate. It you better be a good you know good at getting food, a lot of food, and so it's got it's uh, likely tied to that, and that's also consistent with some of the other studies we did with what they could see, you know, leatherbacks could see uh, certain lights at night that um, the other turtles could see them, but didn't react to them. So I, and one of the, one of the questions we've uh, over the years looked at is whether the lights that were put on fishing lines were attracting leatherbacks. And, you know, the, the leatherbacks seem to pay more, much more attention to those lights than the other turtles, even though they could see them. But it also makes sense that the turtles were testing them at night. By the way, we were, you know, because that's when those lights are on the on the fishing lines that are on at matter. And uh, loggerheads and green turtles don't seem to pay as much attention. And it makes sense if they're that they are, um, you know, not um, feeding at night, and the leatherbacks are. So hmm. a lot of the prey that leatherbacks go after ha are excuse me, bioluminescent. Uh, so that, that, that makes sense that the lights would matter. I, I had this conversation with one of my professors in Costa Rica. He was real interested in why leatherbacks seem to be faring worse than a lot of sea turtles uh, yeah. in their global distribution. And that's, it, it seems like maybe it's a, a lot of different factors all playing little things, but that's something that you wouldn't think about, but it even goes back to that pineal sense. Maybe they're, they're just sensing that more, and that's why it's more developed. Yeah, I yeah, I don't. That's good. 
good question. I mean, you know, it could be in the leatherbacks, especially the Pacific leatherbacks are really in bad, bad shape. Um, you know, the, the leather East, East Pacific leatherbacks, you know, are, are really at risk of going extinct in our lifetimes. And, um, both yours and mine, and I'm a lot older than you are, so it's something that I I worry about a lot, and I'm I'm pretty pretty interested in using the science we've got to help help uh, res resolve some of those problems. Uh, fisheries bycatches remains a problem, and you know the, the, if you go back to your basic um, I don't know, life history strategies, uh, you know these animals make many, many young and, you know, the uh, things that make many, many young aren't putting a lot of uh, energy or quality control into any one individual, which if, considering that if you have, you know, one, you know, the, the classic one in a thousand is probably as good a, an estimate as we can come up with even still for what, how many make it, how many hatchlings make it to a, a, adulthood. And um, so that, um, that means that you know a, a mom can make a bunch of bunch of kids, and you know over the course of you know four or five years place herself in one male. But as soon as those animals start getting closer and closer to maturity, they're more and more valuable to the population because they've outlived all of those sources of mortality that the young younger, smaller animals are victim to. And um, so, you know, the fisheries bycatch is, um, you know, almost all of it is adults and sub-adult animals. So those that are already breeding and those that are about to breed uh, and uh, and by taking out not only the, the reproducing species the group, but the ones that are not that would be replacing them, that's that's a pretty devastating uh, set of cuts to a population. And so that that in the Pacific, we know that fisheries bycatch has had a pretty profound effect. So as areas where they were, where adults were hunted, uh, traditional hunting where you where one animal was taken for the village, not a big deal. But you know when when you know, motors are put on on Pungas and they, you know, they go out and uh, and catch not one turtle but two or three or four every year for um, traditional use using non-traditional uh, forms of, of getting to the animals. That's that all those things add up. The little, you know, the fisheries bycatch is a big one, and then you know the quality of the animals. Uh, you know, that's a kind of a weird thing to think about. But if you're reducing genetic diversity because you're reducing the number of animals and the avail available mates, uh, we don't know much about the quality of the remaining animals. And um, you know that genetic diversity is what builds in variation, and variation is what evolution acts acts on. So. Some variety, some var varieties are better than others in terms of this particular habitat or this habitat over here, and so uh, yeah, the conservation components of un you know understanding what we do to the to the environment is a big deal. Yeah, it's it's really interesting the the genetic diversity for leatherbacks specifically too, like that new genome paper that the super low levels of heterozygosity and just overall genetic. Uh, sort of that the pool is very similar. Uh, something else, again, before the broad conservation details, it's just the, the leatherbacks are so interesting. There was, uh, like you said, if you're taking out adults, that's really a bad thing because you're having this huge outsized impact on recruitment that accrues over time. But also it seems like leatherbacks have higher mortality of nests. And th there was a paper that you were I think a co-author on that looked at potentially some interesting mercury contamination can lead yeah. to disruption of and really interesting effects. Maybe you could speak to that. Yeah. So that, that work was done by Justin Peralt and uh, he's still very active in the field of trying to understand um, leatherback health broadly. And um, you know, one of the things that you know, we cued in on uh, by working with a, with a pathologist was that uh, some of the anomalies in the dead turtles were consistent with mercury toxicity. 
And, you know, most of us know that some predatory fish, many predatory fish have high mercury loads just because it's accumulating in, um, in over the course of their lives. And uh, uh, so once, in a mercury is not something our bodies or turtle bodies use. You know, there's certain things that we do use that in small quantities are fine, but mercury is not one of them. And there's a, uh, but mercury has been in, in the oceans for a long time. So these animals evolved with mercury. They may not have evolved with as much mercury as uh, the, the, what we were detecting. So uh, what that work showed was that, first of all, these hatchlings are accumulating mercury and, we, and the way it matters is uh, because, you know, if the hatchlings hatch with, with a mercury load, if mom is taking her mercury and dumping it into uh, the eggs, which you know can happen during um, the production of uh, basically the production of the, of the yolks, and uh, that means the hatchlings already hatch with a with a, a mercury uh, mercury load that could buy, you know bias their survival. Now there's an, also a naturally occurring compound selenium that is involved with detoxifying mercury. So it's you know, not going to have its toxic effects uh, in the body. And uh, it turns out, you know, that, that you know, moms also put selenium in the eggs, um, but she can keep her selenium or she can give it to her young. Of course, getting rid of excess selenium uh, means that she's more vulnerable to mercury toxicity herself. And the mercury, you know, we, we were wondering how do the turtles accumulating so much mercury? And it really comes back down to even those little zooplankton that are um, the prey uh, of, you know, salps and pyrosomes and such. Those, those animals accumulate mercury in small quantities, but because of the huge volumes of um, salps and, and jellies of all kinds that these animals eat, they're eating a lot of low concentrations of mercury, but the volume is just tremendous. And then eventually they, their mercury loads, the adults' mercury loads gets, get built up. So that's how the moms get it is it's, it basically is, uh, you know, back to to the, uh, you know, when you have to eat a lot of low calorie prey, prey you're also bringing in other things with it that uh, can't get rid of because it's part of the part of the body of the animal you're eating. It's just you're eating a lot of them. So it's interesting. Those habits of feeding at the shore probably put them at, at increased risk of mortality, but also just the contents of what they're eating, that specialization yeah. is just unfortunate. Yeah, it, and this isn't all always just near the shore. This is out in the open ocean too. This is, if, this is, <laughs> I hate to tell you that that's out in the open ocean too, but it is. Yeah, like, yeah, or, yeah, near the surface is, I think, I think I'm just, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, okay. yeah it's, I mean, and, and, you know, it's not like they're eating, um, you know, predatory fish, but predatory fish are accumulating in it as well. That's why, if you look at the, uh, uh, you know, guides for how much how much uh, of this species of fish you should eat, be allowed to eat in a week or a month, um, it it makes a big difference. And uh, because you know mercury is so ubiquitous now, and you know largely due to our pollutants. But uh, anyway, the ocean doesn't save us from everything. Right. So it, it sort of transition, I think, to overall sea turtle conservation in the in the vein of that. Um, it's something really interesting that you've worked on is how climate change is going to impact sex ratios of turtles, and that's a worry. Uh, right now, it seems like a lot of the big kind of meta analyses of reptile declines, climate change is sort of low on the list of immediate issues, but it's very high on the list of potential issues. Mm -hmm. So if you could speak to that, what what are we looking at? And it doesn't seem like the debate is super black and white. There's a lot of nuance potentially. Yeah. So I mean, the the if, if we're talking, I'm going to talk about sea turtles primarily. Although, you know, the if you could translate much of what I say for any of any turtle, um, 
And uh, most of the most many reptiles, most turtles have environmentally determined sex. So no X and Y chromosome. Um, there are like three species that are a caveat to that, but uh, we won't worry about them. All the sea turtles have environmentally sex determined, uh, all environmentally determined sex. And so the um, this turtle system is um, what we call hot chicks, cool dudes. So the warmest temperatures that the nest is incubating at are gonna pr produce females and the coolest nest temperatures, which are not ever cool in the case of sea turtles. Um, are going to be uh, producing primarily males, and then those intermediate temperatures are really interesting. But uh, in general, we see a, a female bias in the population anyway. So uh, for the long, I got into looking at uh, how to how do you identify sex of young turtles, and when I say young turtles, I'm talking about size of the palm of my hand turtles, and so that. Um, that was that really, I mean, it's, it, it was just a fascinating area to begin with because, it was, you know, when I was a graduate student, this was just showing up in lizards and then, uh, you know, then identified in snapping turtles and, uh, and then in loggerhead turtles and the European pond turtles. And it's like, holy cow, this is, this is a, you know, crazy way of thinking about, you know, these animals you know, the environment is determining, you know, what the sex ratios are. And so we, you know, with, when you're dealing with a endangered or threatened species, I mean, that, that's, a, that, that's a problem in production someplace. It may be a problem because they're not enough of one sex versus the other, or you, there, there's, you know, maybe, you know, a loss of juveniles and, or maybe it's loss of adults, or maybe the adults aren't accumulating enough nutrients to reproduce. You know, there's a lot of things that can cause loss of production. But I, you know, nobody really done a deep dive into the. Um, at the time I started this, uh, nobody done a deep dive into what the sex normal sex ratios were, and you know, at that time, you know, the the literature on climate change was just beginning to show up. And so the question was, well, we, you know, what's, what's a baseline sex ratio? So I thought I'd be doing this for two or three years. And, you know, we, we thought all the male, we started blogger interviews because they were threatened. And so we get permission to try new things with threatened species before you can with an endangered one. And so we started off by asking the question, what are the, what's a loggerhead sex ratio along the East coast of the United States? And you know, I did this work with, um, uh, a cohort of folks from the National Marine Fisheries Service and other universities, and um, it was an incredible effort to I did, first of all come up with a method that work and be non-lethal. And uh, just the one of the reasons we didn't know very much about the sex ratios was because the method at the time, you know, back, this is now uh, 25 years ago uh, or so, uh, was was they, they would get a subset of hatchlings and sacrifice them and find out what, what their gonads were, the testes or ovaries and what was the nest temperature. And we, we didn't want to do that. We wanted to measure nest temperatures and then take a subset of animals across the whole season so that we could characterize you know, at the beach level or at the region level of what, what the sex ratios were. And so long story short was that, you know, we found out, um, you know, that first of all, that yes, we were, we were right. Males uh, were at the less warm temperatures and females are at the warmer temperatures. But over time, uh, we quickly, after the, like the second year, it wasn't like the first year in terms of sex ratios and uh, we, we thought all the loggerhead males were coming from up north, from you know, Virginia and South Carolina and North Carolina and Georgia, and that Florida was producing all the girls. And that was, that was uh, you know, in, in hindsight, a stupid assumption because these animals are nesting in the summer. And the summer is hot in hot places. So, uh, you know, so our assumptions about where the males were coming from quickly uh, kind of dissolved. So yes, any of those places can produce males, including Florida, 
but because Florida was producing about 85% of the loggerheads, we were still producing more males, even in low years than, than the other sites were. So that was, you know, kind of the first major discovery. And the second one was um, that if you have uh, early, early spring, you know, spring storms that inundate nests, the male production goes away because those nests die. And uh, so, so the increased prevalence, you know, tying this back to climate change is the increased prevalence of more severe storms is a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, if you think about, well, I'm going to report that we have 85%. I'm making this up, by the way. If I, I'm going to present, say we have 85% females this year, um, but we had, you know, two hurricanes came through and they killed all the nests from that were laid in, in August and September, that doesn't really give you the potential of the population. It gives you what that year is. And then and those, those late season storms <coughs> don't, you know, take out production because the nests can't survive being underwater very, for very long at all. And, uh, and often don't survive being underwater period, even if it's just, you know, one tide cycle. So it's a it it's kind of those those severities of storms and frequency of storms is a big deal. Uh, I mean, this year alone, we uh, you know I'm mean, it's now 2023, uh, almost the end, and we bring these turtles in the labs uh, from early in the middle and end of the season. We still have two nests on the beach from the end of the season that luckily did not get wiped out. Um, but early in the season, we our early season nests were we would normally bring be bringing in turtles in late May, early June, and uh, we didn't get them till about the middle of June because uh, an, a severe spring storm just wiped out those early nests, and so um, that's shifted our sex ratio. So this year is going to be you know, less than, you know, the, the production of females is going to come out is, is less than, uh, uh, you know, less than, less than 1%. And the problem I'm, I'm seeing is um, whether it's super hot, super dry seasons, which are a big deal too. We're seeing more of those as well, where this, in the middle of the season will get, uh, it's normal for us to get a couple weeks of drought, but when you have a couple of months of drought, that, you know, there are two things that happen. It gets hot, the nests get hot, and they don't, they don't, uh, if they produce any turtles at all, they, uh, they're females and they're usually little um, because they need that moisture, regular moisture to, to uh, metabolize yolk and turn yolk into turtle. Um, and then, or you, or you just see the whole nest dies. And that's, that we're seeing more and more of that. And that, that's a problem. So the sex ratio is an issue, but so is the production. And, um, yeah, so that, that's become, um, kind of a high highlight of, you know, what, what we're doing. <laughs> what we're doing that's affecting the turtles is telling us a lot about not just turtles. It's telling us about what's too hot and too dry for turtles is also too hot and too dry for um, plants. Crops, insects, pollinators, um, too hot for us to, so uh, humanity has to care. The turtles are telling us a story, though. And the story is, story is going to be highly skewed sex ratios or terrible production or, and eventually both. Right. And we have to have enough foresight to act now, right? This is yeah. something that it hasn't yeah. happened yet, but we're seeing it. I mean, it well, it, Seems like it is happening now, but it, it's just yeah. going to get worse. So. Yeah, I mean, I when I got into this, like I say, I thought I was going to be establishing a baseline in two or three years, and there's just so you know, I would like to say there's so much variation, but the thing the thing that really got my attention was, you know, in the first ten years, seeing just a couple of years that were considered normal by the uh, National Weather Service, and when each and every year is is a new record high. Or a new record dryness level, or a new record uh, for storm tropical storm severity, it's it's a big deal. That's you know, every, when every year is a record, it's and it's not a record because it's cooler. It's a record because it's hotter. 
uh, that's that's just not compatible with uh, with the animals keeping up with with the change in the uh, environment. Right. Well, one more thing before we go into, we like to at the end do some kind of rapid fire adventure related questions, but I've got one other uh, thing related to conservation. Um, and I've worked a bit in Florida and helped with some projects. And one thing, it seems like Florida is very proactive with uh, beach management and, and mm -hmm. sort of altering the beach to fit different scenarios of erosion and such. Uh, and, and you've looked at this a bit in terms of how this impacts nesting females. Like, how does disturbance of that kind of habitat? And, and sometimes it seems like the work that's done to fix the problem makes something else worse. So there's kind of a trade off. But how does that affect where sea turtles nest? Uh, well, I mean, if you've got big, big equipment, you know, when, when nests are, excuse me, when beaches are being uh, replenished or renourished is the term that's used, um, those. Um, I mean, it takes heavy equipment on the beach, and typically that this has to be done during non-nesting season. Um, it's not not unusual for, especially if there's a big big project for the uh, equipment, which is uh, pumping sand from offshore, shore, not far offshore, but offshore, onto the beach. That's you know not only a big um, ship out there and a big pump and lights and um, that's altering the the underwater habitat. I mean, it goes from being clear and lots of invertebrates and lots of structure uh, to uh, a lot of silt, and uh, that kills a lot, a lot of the invertebrates. So it does have a pretty that kind of uh, renourishment has an effect. Trucked in sand um, again. That's usually smaller projects, and uh, you know that. But the sand has to be placed in such a way that the beach can have the waves run up and and not just carry the sand all back out in an abnormal um, proportion. So that beach nourishment is a whole engineering art um, as well as a, a science. And yeah, I, I mean, I think there's there's increasing um, attention being paid to the nesting beach itself. But I think there's a lot less attention being paid to the hab underwater habitat and to ignore that, I think is is a bit naive. Um, just just simply because these, you know, not just the turtles, but lots of things live underwater, and just because we aren't looking at it um, doesn't mean it's uh, it's not having an impact. Um, I mean, you know, the hawksbills are feeding on uh, things that live in and around sponges, and you know, the algae that the green turtles and the and the hawksbills eat is you know, buried in silt and that's not, you know, so it, it changes where food is and where other organisms can live. Um, so that's, that, that's one piece of it. Well, I mean, you know, the, in terms of the beach placement, I mean, Florida's interested in beach placement for a lot of reasons. And the turtles, I think are, a, you know, maybe a flagship for why they do it, but tourism is a big driver. And so is the, uh, uh, value of property, uh, you know, beachfront property is uh, is uh, expensive. It's you know, the people who live on the beach are not the poor fishermen anymore. They're they're um, you know people who are uh, spending money in in our communities and spending a lot of money. So dollars dollars drive, um, you know, money drives what happens. And if the beach starts going away and <coughs> somebody's uh, you know, major dwelling or their condominium, which houses, you know, 36 families of, of great wealth is going to uh, fall down. Uh, it's a big deal. And so there's a lot of, a lot of emphasis on protecting upland structures by making sure the beach is there. The beach is, is the barrier that protects those things. Tur the turtles just get to take advantage of that. Um, and some of that works, it works really well. And some of it doesn't, depends on how it's, it's, uh, put together. Right. It's, yeah. It's an interesting question. It seems like sometimes it's sort of just a, a scamper to figure out like how long, long can we offset this before we need to do another dance behind it? 
beach renourishment is still developing and we, we without being able to predict what's going to happen current wise and it's just sort of a, a lot of moving parts and and but perhaps like you're saying the animals well not perhaps the, the animals are not really the thing that's the priority which is kind of an issue yeah. um so transitioning to the adventure side of it i think it's it's fun to talk about the research but there's a lot of cool stuff that happens that doesn't get put in the publication uh i'm curious what the most interesting story you have from your work is and maybe the most interesting place that you worked oh wow um well i've i've, I've been lucky in that i've gotten a chance to at least see and measure i think all of the species now which is really kind of cool i mean uh, that was that was not, I would say not intentionally one of my, my my goals, but over the course of you know asking questions and identifying what the different species are teaching me, um, you know that's one of the things you do standard is well how big are the animals you're working with, and so I you know but in terms in terms of being able to say ah, I've worked with all of them that's that's pretty pretty fun. Um, the uh, I mean, it's hard to pick any one thing. I would say there there were several things that kind of stand out as as being fun and cool. And one of them, and it's not a field study, was figuring out how to attach uh, little tags to turtles. Was you know that that uh, when we were I was doing this work with Kate Mansfield and and uh, you know, we start off with the standard. You know, should we use? You know, they, now these are little turtles. These are the size. And uh, you know we were we were putting these solar powered satellite tags. We wanted to put those out and do our you know really the first little turtle tracking, and um, it, at least it was more than following a turtle in a boat or following a turtle with a mask and snorkel. And um, so we had the, I, I because I'm doing the sex ratio work, I have to raise the turtles for a little while in the lab. Uh, just so they've used up their yolk and that's why they're there. And so I make them work in other projects while they're there. And so we got permission to test different ways of attaching tags. And it started off as, well, the standards is epoxy. And uh, so uh, Kate made some epoxy attachments and we used four or five turtles of that. And then we also thought, well, silicone works pretty well on aquariums. So we'll try some silicone. And, you know, and, uh, you know, then there was the, maybe we should have a harness on them. So we tried harness, a couple different kinds of harnesses and none of these things were working out and we were getting a little frustrated. And uh, we, you know, my anatomy background kind of came back to haunt us. And I said, well, we need something that's going to stick to the keratin, which is what the scoots are made out of. So like your fingernails and, um, then you know but it's got to be allow the turtle to grow because they're going to grow and then it's got to fall off and you know so kate's kate and i are sitting there talking and uh, she looks down on my feet and i i had uh, a pedicure done with uh, i always have waves on my toes and uh and, and she she says oh how do you how do you keep that stuff on your feet and keep it looking good and i said well you know, they, they clean up my, my, you know, nail and, and add some little product to it. And then they put the, the, the other stuff on. And, and I said, but I'm that the toes are easy. It's the hands. And my husband plays classical guitar and he has, has really weak nails. So he goes in and gets one hand manicured every few weeks to put, uh, you know, Interesting. he has nails. And I, she says, really? And I said, yeah, and he died, and he also works on sea turtles, and he di di digs in nests, and he's out in the water, and it does fine. And and she says, really? And I I said, well, I can call the manicurist and ask her what she does to my husband's hands. And uh, so I called up the manicurist, and she says, says, oh yeah, I just put an acrylic base coat on him, and it works fine. And I said, can I bring you a turtle? And she said, uh, no, um, but I can tell you where to get the stuff. So I went to the uh, drugstore and picked up uh, an acrylic nail kit. And we tried putting acrylic uh, base coat after buffing the turtle up and 
cleaning it off. And, uh, you know, we did that with about, I don't know, six or eight turtles and, and uh, put these dummy tags on them in the lab. And wow, it worked like a charm. And so we, you know, so it's thinking outside the, the box was, was important. But then, you know, once we got that, we needed something that was going to really hold um, the, uh, the tag on. And, and so, you know, I'd come home from the beach at night, late at night. And, you know, the last thing you want to do is jump in bed with sand all over you. So I'd take a shower and have to wait for my hair to dry. And I'd watch late night TV while I'm, you know, waiting for my hair to dry. And I saw this ad where this, um, uh, you know, there was a picture of or a video of advertising uh, hair club for men. And there was this t- t- video of this guy swimming with his toupee on and, and, uh, you know, riding in a jet ski with a girl hanging onto his hair. And I thought, Hmm, that's an idea. They're gluing that stuff on. How can I get some of that glue? So I called up Kate Mansfield and I said, Kate, can you get me some of this? And he, I can't, I didn't have any luck calling, calling up because I didn't have a, uh, a cosmetics license so she didn't either but she's she was more per- persuasive and uh, she called up the company that made the adhesives and uh, so we end up stabilizing the shell with acrylic and attaching the tags with toupee glue and so that was that was i think probably one of the most fun um you know thinking outside the box and you know ne- always being open to, to new ways of thinking about how to do it and then and turns out green turtles you can't stick acrylic to and have it do anything so then i had to reinvent the wheel again that one that one worked but it wasn't as, anywhere as much fun as the, the lager head attachments and every it turns out every species is a little different and so uh i've learned more about keratin than i ever wanted to know <laughs> and and products that might stick to it and i'm still still watching for for new stuff that might work uh, so that was, I would say, the most fun um, in terms of being rewarding and positive and working. Um, I would say the most, uh, uh, another one that's, that's really impressive is when I've gotten a chance to go out, when we release these turtles with tags, we take them out in the Gulf Stream. And the, you know, the, the Gulf Stream, I, I would get in the water with the, when the animals were released to make sure that the, you know, turtles without tags watch their behavior in the Gulf Stream and where are they in the water column and what's their attitude and do they swim or do they float or you know how you know how are they get paying attention to the sargassum and if they've got a tag on them does it get tangled up we, we did all this stuff in the lab first but I wanted to make sure the field was uh, telling us uh, a lot and and the, it's just so strikingly beautiful out there uh, wouldn't want to be out there when the when the wind is in the the tide, you know, the seas are really high, but when it's fairly calm, it's just you know the animals are beautiful in that water, and it's most intense iridescent blue. Um, so that's 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 pretty pretty nice. Um, yeah, so I, I would say that's that. Those are my, kind of my two favorite stories. I've I've been in the water with them with the uh, flatbacks. Um, and uh, that water is not as clear, uh, so it, and uh, uh, you know, it's really, really pretty, uh, pretty uh, interesting time to to get in the water. But areas that have lots of product, productivity of their water uh, also have other things in the water that you might want to watch out for. So, uh, yeah, you know, being in water where you have to care about cro- crocodiles gets your attention. So, I, I, I didn't didn't want to do that. Uh, didn't stay in rain any longer than I had to. So, yeah, interesting, interesting times. And, uh, yeah, I've learned a lot from that. And I, I'm not done yet. Yeah, right. There's so much more. It's, it's, uh, it'll be cool to see it. Here's the time. You've given us some, some, uh, the hints to things to look out for. So it's exciting. One other thing, too, we, I all, well, myself and Jack and Wyatt and some of the guys that I uh, couldn't make it today have, have all helped with, the Colonial Research Institute, and we actually helped move that to where it is now. Oh, and wow. It, yeah, we, we helped pack it up into boxes and uh, ship it to California. 
Um, and so that's, we've done that. But like the legacy of Dr. Peter Pritchard is incredible. Uh, and I, I think that you, because he would work with sea turtles a lot. And we like to chase all the cool stories that he had. Yeah. I'm curious, what, what was it like to when he came down and helped with any projects? Or did you interact with him much? Or uh, I, Well, I did when I was doing the anatomy guide. I spent quite a bit of time up in uh, the uh, Sony Research Institute because he had all the species. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't, you know, some of it he didn't have, you know, all of the postcranial material. But he was very proud of having every, as he put it, every genus. And, um, you know, and of course he was such a good storyteller. I mean, he, and his stories were real, you know, what had, you know, I, I, I would, I loved hearing Peter Pritchard tell stories. Um, yeah, he, he was just a, you know, a, a very interesting person who not only, um, I mean, some of the places he, he'd been, uh, you know, and, it's it took took a, a, a physically powerful person to be there and um, very astute um, to culture and um, and then you know being prepared to to learn something new he was yeah he was amazing I yeah uh, you know, I wouldn't be I I will absolutely tell you I would not be as knowledgeable as I am without the lessons I learned just from sitting and talking with him. And uh, yeah, so you know, when, when so if you 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 pack the stuff up from the um, it's institute when it was in, the, in that little house, and I was up in the third or maybe it's the fourth story of his his house, uh, sweating in the, in the attic, you know, measuring stuff, and eventually when he said, "Well, we're, we, I bought this house across the way, and it's going to be a museum," I hold shells down and heads down and jars down and i didn't do all of it but you know i spent i think i spent two or three days and then you know he you know when you when you were done with that day you, you know you he'd say well if you want to stay in the in the institute you know, you know i've got a camp mat so i i slept in the boardroom on the floor a couple of times so wow was, <laughs> sleep sleeping underneath the camp's ridley shell so yeah no, that that's interesting. I didn't realize that you helped move it from the first place it was, and then yeah, yeah, yeah it was it was an incredible place. I mean, the, the feel when you walk in through the doors, it's just you're completely surrounded by turtles, but just history and just all of his adventures. I mean, it's it's uh, fortunate that it's not in that same place because the place itself held a lot of things. But I think that where it's at now is is certainly a, a, a new journey for it. So. Uh, it's just, it's always cool to get those stories. So the, the last question that we like to ask, um, unless there's anything you want to add, um, is just if you had one piece of advice or it, it can be multiple or, or however you want to answer the question, for someone interested in studying turtles and making that a career, what would that be? Oh, know, know your basic science, plain and simple. I mean, yeah, you know, I... I, tell, I mostly I'm dealing with college kids, but, um, you know, I, as a kid, I learned a lot picking up the, you know, the, the, the natural history books, you know, the, the, you know, Clifford Pope's book on, uh, you know, it, that's an old one. It didn't have, it had very few illustrations in it, but I was old enough to read. I didn't understand all the words, but I could get most of what I needed. Um, and then, you know, when I went to uh, undergrad school, you know, discovering, the, you know, the some of the literature. But, you know, at the at the end of the day, I like I say, I'm I'm the. Some people would consider me a major expert on sea turtles. I'm from Central Illinois. I grew up as far from the water as you you could imagine. When I went to graduate school, I went to the University of Illinois, far from the water. So you, you the way I was able to build up my background in oceanography, which I never had a course in, but I found a, a couple of really good books from my, the Open University in, in the UK has this whole ser series of books on, um, you know, physical oceanography, oceanography, chemical oceanography, biological oceanography. So I learned about the oceans, both from, you know, hanging out with 
people who worked there uh, on the ocean, but also from reading about it. And and then I could use, uh, you know, when I was learning about whether it was how the heart worked or how the, you know, the, the animals are able to hold their breath and you know why the brain is built the way it was. It was I was falling back on my basic biology, my basic chemistry, my basic physics, and um, so. You know, it's. I have to say, when you're when you're an undergrad, especially, you know, and you have to take general biology one and two, general chemistry one and two, organic chemistry one and two, physics one and two, you're just kind of going. When am I going to get to something fun? And uh, and it's like, well, there's parts of it that are fun in it, but if you're getting out and away from the computer, getting going out in the field, I mean, even if it's just going and turning over rocks, you're going to start using your and looking and see what lives under them, you're going to start using your science. And uh, so don't forget your basic science. It, it opens the doors for so many things. That's good. That's good to know. We'll definitely take it to heart. And for anyone listening, uh, that's uh, a lot of our listeners are undergraduates or in some level of school. So uh, that's, yeah. that's really nice. The last thing we like to do too uh, is yeah, we, we can do this out. It, we don't even have to do it, but if you want to, uh, it, it could be fun. It's turtle trivia. So a quick volley of turtle trivia. We can do this any number of ways. You can ask us questions, or we can go back and forth a few times, or we can ask you questions, however you want it. Uh, and if you are if you need to go, totally understand that too. But go, go, Hit me with it. See what, see what I remember. All right, Jason, you want to start us off? I'll, I'll throw you up because uh, I, uh, <laughs> I, I I might be a bit rough. I, like my mind has not been on, you know, although we're partaking in a turtle podcast, my mind has not been on turtles here. So uh, I know I, I guess I could, I could, could throw, I guess, uh, well, I guess like, yeah, we could go. This might be kind of easy, but that, that's kind of where I'm at right now. That's okay. So, um, I guess what's the what's the uh, like genus and species name for like the uh, the pink belly side neck? I don't know. All right, Jason, you want to throw it up there? We it's a uh, Emidura subglobosa. So. Oh, I should have known that. I used to have one. Yeah, it's. Oh yeah, I mean they're like a, the, the most common like. Yeah, you know, but mine didn't have turtle from mine that. didn't have a pink belly. It was a, it was an old. Yeah, I mean it was a rescue yeah. and yeah. So oh god, yeah, that's embarrassing. But okay, yeah. keep. <laughs> yeah. You thought it was easy to me. That was like, wow. I haven't thought about. I mean, I've got a couple of side necks yeah. in my collection, but uh, they're uh, yeah. they they're they're about the dullest colored ones they are. So you know. Yeah. yeah, this, uh, Dr. Monikin, do you want to add, do you have one for us? I usually say to people, well, I usually try to tell people this while I send out the invitation, but I would say the past 20 or so inquiries I've, I've sent to people, I've completely forgot. So I, I'm sorry to put you. Okay. Up. So uh, here, here's but, one for you. Okay. Um, you know, what, how to, let's see. I'm trying to think how to phrase this. Um, thinking about eggs here. Okay. So how do turtles make an egg? Okay. That's, that's a interesting question that could take a lot of explanation. Uh, <laughs> I, okay. Give me a flow chart. Yeah, I can, I can, I can try to think about this. Uh, Jason, do you want to add any? Uh, do you want me to give the rundown and then you can add anything, or I, I I'll go? Okay, so I I'm not sure. If I'll, yeah, I was going to say I'm not sure if I'll have anything you know significant or you know of value to add. So you can go ahead. Okay, so the the follicle begins to develop due to some sort of stimulus, and it, it's some kind of hormonal stimulus, and it, that's the progesterone and the the, the uh, estrogen and such interact in a way that causes that to start. It develops to a specific size. It's maybe 30 millimeters, I think, where it eventually ruptures and you get the ova that are released. 
the ova are released for a second free floating and they make their way to the oviduct and the oviduct is five chambers in it and the where the sperm actually meets the egg is one of those upper chambers the egg will it takes about two weeks it in the second to most top chamber of the oviduct for it to calcify or the albumin is laid and then it calcifies in that third chamber for about two weeks and then it's passed down to the infundibulum it i forget the names for all of them and it sits there for a while and then it will eventually get passed through the cloaca i think that's kind of a rough outline some of the specifics are a bit fuzzy but i don't know if that's sufficient that's 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 pretty good i think you've got, you got the infundibulum in the wrong place but that's okay okay yeah yeah excellent okay excellent. uh okay <laughs> yeah if if do we want to do another or i think maybe yeah maybe that's that's good for now we've gone a, a good deal of time uh but thank you so much for oh, my pleasure sitting down with us it was really interesting we really had very little sea turtle uh focus so it's it's been great to incorporate this you know it seems like the two fields are kind of separate but they're all turtles so it's all it, turtles yeah. yeah so yeah thank you so much uh You're if you welcome. Anything that you want to say that we didn't cover? Uh, I don't think, think you guys are doing an amazing job of doing your homework first. And uh, I was very impressed with the, the, the scope of what you've covered. So, yeah, keep it up. It's awesome. Yeah, thank you for sitting down with us. Uh, this is an awesome discussion for everyone. This is episode 46. We'll see you on the next one.